This morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. We'll finish up the chapter. It's been a, a long walk, but we've been really focusing on Herod in this whole chapter and his uh, frustration with Jesus, his anger with Jesus, his wrath, in a sense, with Jesus. And so uh, we're going to end with that this morning. Anger does not change the situation. How many of you have learned that? That being angry doesn't change the situation. It really doesn't. It took me a long time to learn that, but I realized that me getting upset doesn't change the situation. Uh, there have been times where I have taken my fist and tried to, you know, bust through the windshield, and it only made the situation worse. There's been times where I raised my voice in anger and frustration, and it only made things worse. It didn't make them better. Anger is a condition, someone said, in which the tongue works faster than the mind. <laughs> the tongue works faster than the mind. You don't think, and you just speak it out. And of course, the Bible says what, what you speak from the heart is really what's in your, in your heart. If you speak it out loud, that's really what's there. That's the intention, and that's where sin enters in. The Bible d does say that be angry, but sin not. Now, how do you do that? That's the question. Jesus, we saw, he was angry at the money changers and he turned the tables over and he began to whip things and so forth and yet it was a righteous anger. The Bible never says don't be angry. There are times where you can be angry. When there are situations like our president uh, of the United States today, it, it, it is frustrating and it does cause some anger on the hearts of some people because of the decisions that he's making and they're really blatant and so you can get a little frustrated with that it becomes sin when you then want to do something harmful to him that's when it becomes sin uh, you can get angry if somebody is abusing your kid and bullying them in school you can get angry but you don't go and bully the little kid and you know let him know that you're not going to touch my kid you you take the proper measures and so the Bible never talks about getting back. But it, it never, I'm sorry, it never talks about, it doesn't talk about getting back either. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But it never talks about us getting not angry. It's okay to be angry. It, it reveals that we have a passion, we have a love, we have a hunger, we have ideas, we have thoughts, and all of us have those things. And it's good to have those things. But sin not. That is really the challenge that we have as believers is not to sin against an individual. So we need anger management, don't we? We really need anger management. Husband said to the wife, I, you never get mad at me when, you, when, when I'm angry at you. Uh, how do you control your anger? And the wife says, I clean the toilet bowl. Husband says, okay, so how does that help you? Because I use your toothbrush. And some of us are thinking, I'm going to check my toothbrush when I get home. <laughs> That's how she controlled her anger. Today's theme is anger misses the mark. Anger misses the mark. Now, two points with that, and the reason for me giving it the theme is, is that anger does miss the mark. Uh, miss, sin is missing the mark, right? We, we know that. We understand the definition of sin is missing the mark. God has set a mark, and we miss it every time. And so if we get angry, we're missing God's mark. When we're sinning. But also Herod missed the mark. His anger, his frustration was against Jesus. And yet he missed it. Because he never did uh, kill Jesus or murder Jesus. Uh, he murdered a lot of others. And there are always casualties. There will always be casualties in the work of God. Always. That's something that, that I realized. That in the work of God there will be casualties. Uh, you don't want casualties. You don't want people to get frustrated and upset and, and so forth, but because of the Word of God and because of the work of God, there will always be casualties. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. There's always someone that gets hurt. There's always someone that gets frustrated. There's always someone that gets angry. Let me outline these few verses for you so that we get an idea of the context. As we look at verses 16 through 18, we find that Herod does slay many children. He does act out upon his anger. And in 19 through 20, we see that God has vengeance on Herod and he dies. And so he will stand against uh, God himself in that great day of the judgment and be condemned for eternal life. 
And then 21 through 23, we see God's plan continuing to unfold in the life of Jesus as Jesus transitions to the next stage of his life, as Jesus returns to Nazareth, where he will reside for quite a while. So let's go ahead and and read chapter 2, verses 16 through 23. It says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that uh, Archelaus had or was reigning over Judea, that is Joseph, instead of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Herod slays the children. We don't know the exact age of Jesus at this point. We know that through the text it was two years and under. Some commentaries say possibly 40 days to two years old. And so Herod, to play it safe, decided that he would just kill every male child that was two years old and under. And so he went with his men and he literally took all the male children that he could find, and he murdered every one of them and in the surrounding areas. It says when Herod, now as it says in the Greek, then Herod or after Herod. So this is taking place in a moment in Herod's life where he is the subject of this conversation and in this context here, where after Herod, when he saw that they had deceived him, who deceived him? The the wise men. And it wasn't necessarily that they deceived him and he realized that they deceived him, but it was, it, it, the Greek suggests that his emotions were involved here. That he, he felt tricked. As though they tricked him. Or they made him a fool. He had asked them to come back to him and let him know where this child was so that he could go and worship him. But from Herod's perspective, as they left, because they were warned by the Lord not to go back to Herod, from Herod's perspective, he felt like he was played on. And not just by one person, but by the wise men. It really should be plural. He felt tricked by all of them. And so you can see the delusion that he was in through the Greek. This man was really upset because he felt little by what these men did. He took it very personally, as though it was an attack on him, and he was going to leash out on it. Uh, Usually that's what anger uh, does, is when we feel like someone's questioning our ability, questioning our authority, questioning our manlyhood, you know, we feel attacked personally. You think I'm an idiot? You think I'm stupid? You think I don't know what I'm doing? And immediately we want to fight back. That's how he felt, because these men didn't return to him. And so he became exceedingly, (laughs) King James says it very clearly, exceedingly angry. Why? Because they tricked him. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all the districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. James tells us very clearly in James chapter 1 verse 20, for the wrath of man, uh, he makes it clear the wrath of man, does not produce the righteousness of God. Man's wrath cannot produce the righteousness of God. And so we need to depend on God to defend us. And that's 
hard for so many of us to, to learn because we do get upset and angry right away. In letting God be our defender. Letting God take care of things. It's like a jealous husband who will literally, out of frustration and rage, will abuse his wife because he has no self-control. And because he's allowing the situation to eat at his heart and, and his body that he has to respond that way. This is the first of 21 unsuccessful attempts on the life of Jesus Christ by the enemy Satan and his desire to cut him off from the work that he's going to do. And so it's a little frustrating on Herod's part. Galatians 4, 6 says, if you remember the story of Cain and Abel, that Cain was asked by the Lord, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? And so Cain, because his offering to the Lord was rejected by God because it was the work of his hands and Abel's was received by the Lord because it was, it was a, a work of love. It was a work of, uh, uh, of God as he gave unto the Lord a sacrifice that was required. And Cain, who gave of his hands and his work, and yet God rejected it, he was angry. His countenance fell. And what did he do? We know the story. He killed Abel out of frustration. So he was angry and he sinned. We know that in this moment where Herod was attempting to murder Jesus, it was a moment where he was trying to fulfill the Old Testament uh, in Genesis where Satan would bite the heel of Jesus. And that's what Satan was trying to do here. There seems to be a, a hatred for children on Satan's part, doesn't there? Abel, Jesus, and, and many other children that, that Satan has killed. And we see that even today. The population at, at this time, if you were to calculate about a thousand adults or so, you could probably figure that there were some 30 to 40 boys, three years old and under for every thousand adults. And so if there were, you know, 10,000, then you're talking about 300 young children. If there were 20,000, you're talking maybe 600 young children that were murdered by Herod himself. Statistically, they tell us that since Roe versus Wade, there has been 57 million babies aborted. When you think about that, that is a lot of children who have been murdered by their mother, father, and those in society. 50 million babies. That's a lot. If you put all the abortions in the whole world to this date, there have been 1.3 billion babies aborted. That's amazing. Where's our heart? Do we cry out? I, I think those children are crying out to God right now for vengeance, for judgment to come. And God is just. And I think that this is an example for us today that we are living in the last days for children innocent little children to be taken and murdered i don't know if you've you've even seen some of the videos uh, of how abortions take place and there are various types of abortions but i was just watching one the other day and i don't mean to make you squirmish or anything nor bring condemnation on you because there's forgiveness and there's grace and there's mercy of god if you if you confess that sin if you repent of it and if you have had that type of sin uh, take place in your life, I would hope that you would see a call in, in protecting children and fighting against it even, if you can. But there's this one form of abortion where they will take utensils and they will stick it into uh, the woman's uterus and up where the baby's at and they will begin to cut the limbs of the babies arms, legs. And then they will take another utensil, forceps, and reach in and pull them out and put them in a container and in a bag and throw it in the trash. Now, that's a little graphic, isn't it? But that's what happens. And I think that we need to wake up to what is going on in the world today. This year alone, just this year alone, from January 1st to this day, we have 119 thousand 
babies already aborted. What can we do? We, we, we need to pray. We need to repent. The church needs to stand up. Somebody needs to stand. Somebody needs to, to say, we need to stop this. Well, what ministry am I called to? Maybe you're called to that. I don't know. There are plenty of ministries. I would love to have a ministry here in this church where it is focused on uh, the abortions, keeping the people informed. Uh, What can we do? Uh, What kind of tracks are out there? Uh, What kind of events? What kind of petitions can we sign? What's alternatives? Uh, There was a woman that I was speaking with um, last year. She had called me up and asked me for some information concerning uh, abortion, concerning birth control. There's another issue is birth control. There are certain types of birth control that are literally aborting babies. And we don't even know it, but we're taking it. Well, not me, but women are taking these, these birth controls and it literally aborts a baby. And so there's alternatives to that. And those are the type of things that we need to know as the body of Christ. Because Satan loves it. The fact that he's just killing children left and right. Millions upon millions upon millions. And he's just laughing over it. Because that's what he wants to do. He is that evil. And if he had the opportunity, he would take your children today and rip them apart personally. But because of God's grace and his protection that he has on them, because of your prayers and your love and your training for your children, Satan doesn't touch them because God is there protecting them because of you but you stop and you let your children go you let them wander the way they want to wander and satan will eat them up and the responsibility is upon you as the parent not the church not the friday night youth leader it's you it's you and that's why girls are getting pregnant and then having abortions and not telling anybody about it we need to stand up just recently uh, one of the ladies here at the church wanted to get involved and so she she now is going to help out my wife with political issues and so she's going to put a table out there and hopefully you'll go visit the table and look at what's going on politically in in the world and she wants to be active there and that's what we need we need a a table for innocent baby and there's plenty of materials out there someone needs to stand up the pastor can't do it all Please, ladies, um, young ladies, girls, boys, save yourself for your husbands and for your wives. Don't let the enemy lie to you and destroy you. You save yourself until you are married, as God has prescribed in his scriptures, so that God would receive glory and honor as you're wedded to your husband and to your wife on that day. Don't allow the enemy to destroy you and to use you the way that he wants to use you. Stand up and be a man and fight. Stand up and be a godly woman and say, I'm going to fight for this instead of fighting for unrighteousness. Now James has some qualities that are needed as we're going through trials that make us angry. James chapter 1 verse 19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so he tells us we should be slow to wrath. Don't get upset. Proverbs says, wrath of a king is like a roaring lion. You get a king angry and he can be like a lion. Proverbs 27, 4 says, wrath is cruel and anger a torrent. James tells us, be slow to to anger. We as born again believers, we need to put on something else instead of anger. We need to take off anger and put on gentleness. Colossians is clear. Write this down. Colossians 3, 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these things. Paul says, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language. If you're a person that uses swear words, you need to stop. Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one. If you're a liar, don't lie to one another. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. So that's the old man. We're to put him off. And and so if you're sitting here in the church today and and you see some of these things in your life, if you see that you get angry or you get frustrated, uh, there's some malice in you. And malice is when you want to get back at somebody. You're just going to, if I could just hurt you, you know, a little bit. Um, wrath, 
blasphemy, slandering someone's name. Uh, when, when people tell you about other people, that's slander. That is slander against that individual. Uh, filthy language, using swear words, cussing, telling dirty jokes, you know, all of those things. That's language that shouldn't be coming out of a Christian's mouth. Lying one another. Listen to what Paul says. And having put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcision nor uncircumcised barbarian, uh, Cyanian, slave or free, but Christ is in all and in all. See, we've been born again. Doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek. Doesn't matter where you came from. We're all new in Christ Jesus. We become born-again believers and we're putting off the old man. He says, therefore, as the elect and holy and beloved, put on. So instead of having anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language, put on this instead. Practice this is what he's saying. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, which is patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do the same. Those are the things we need to put on. Those are the things that we should be practicing. Now, they might not come natural. You, you might think, well, tender mercies. Okay, <clears throat> that's a tough one for me. I have to actually practice that. And so being tender, being tender with people, being tender when they're angry at you, being tender when it's frustrating, being tender. What happens is as you practice those things, like anything else, you get good at it. You get good at it. All of a sudden, you just naturally are tender. You are naturally patient. You're, you're naturally walking in meekness and having long-suffering because you have been practicing it. An athlete who practices to, to run the mile, he, he doesn't just go out there one day and say, I'm going to run the mile and I'm going to win. He, obviously, he's going to lose. He practices. And, and so every day, and every evening, he's out there running the mile, running the mile, running the mile, month after month after month. Now, it's not easy, is it? Sometimes it's raining. Sometimes it's too hot. Sometimes it's too cold. And you're like, maybe tomorrow. No, not today. And this is, I can't do it. No, but you do it because you're committed to do it. You want to win the race at the end. And so you practice, you practice, you practice. And the more you practice, the better you get. And one day you're running the mile and you're beating everybody. Why is that? Because you've been practicing it. And now it's easy. And you can just run that mile without a problem. And so we need to practice these things. We need to put them on. Putting on is like putting on your clothes every morning. right? You take your pajamas off and you put on your clothes. So every morning you say, Lord, help me to put you on. Help me to put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, and meekness. And what happens is, is that we no longer are angry people. We're trusting in God. And really God is the one that... Um, executes justice precisely he knows what he's doing Matthew goes on and says then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet so Herod went in there and really he didn't put on anything anything that was righteous whatsoever he acted out on his home flesh killed a lot of children and Matthew says this was a fulfillment of scripture what Jeremiah said so action, so his actions were a fulfillment of Scripture. It doesn't mean that God planned it. Now, understand that, please. Don't think, oh, see, God planned this. He, he planned the whole murder. He planned it all. No, God doesn't do evil. God is good. And if men don't do good, then men will do evil. If that men don't practice righteousness, then they will practice something. Understand that. If, if you're not living for Christ, you're living for someone else. If you're not doing what God wants you to do, then you're doing what Satan wants you to do. You're doing something for someone. We all are. We're living for someone, for self or someone else, if we're not living for Christ. And so Herod did what he did, not because God made him do it, because he was living for himself, and so he did evil. God didn't make him do evil. The Bible's very clear. The New Bible Dictionary says, God is separate from evil, evil and is in no way responsible for evil at all. Moral evil arises when, or from man's sinful inclinations. That's when evil is there. Evil is the absence of good. As Richard uh, defined it uh, last men's breakfast, he used an analogy of a donut. When the, the, the person makes a, a donut, 
he, he cuts the center out and he makes the donut, but the donut is the, 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 the outside part is the donut that you eat, but there's a center that just is there because you're making a donut and that's is the absence of donut. <laughs> that's why there's a center there. And so the absence of good means that there's evil there and there's a possibility for men to do evil. So James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when there is or has conceived, it brings forth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And so James is clear that God doesn't tempt us with evil, and that if we are evil and practicing evil it's because of our own selfish desires and that just builds up our sin and and we know that sin ultimately leads to death i think it would be fair to say that god is against evil wouldn't you he's against it he doesn't like it so here the scripture matthew quotes verse 18 a voice was heard in rama Now, Ramah was a frontier land in Judah. It was the area that um, men, Jewish and women, were were actually collected to go into captivity in the Babylonian Empire. This is a quotation from Jeremiah, and we know that God has pronounced judgment on the people of Judah during the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is trying to get them to repent to stop their evil ways, stop living in the world, and start living for God. But God is bringing Babylon in to gather up his people, as they did here in Ramah, and bring them into captivity. And so as that is happening during the time of Jeremiah and Judah, there's lamentations, there's weeping, and great mourning. Uh, Some of your manuscripts might might just say... um, weeping and mourning, but this is correct in in, in its order here in the Greek. And then it says, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now he's using Rachel in the story. And this is far from the Christmas story, isn't it? It's not as wonderful as uh, commercialism has made it out to be. So as he quotes this, he, he gives us some understanding to what was going on during the time of Herod. And as Jesus is leaving to Egypt to be protected uh, from Herod. And so he likens it basically to the situation in the exile of Babylon. So like the children of Israel who were gathered together here in the fortress and they were taken into captivity, there was much lamentation, much weeping, Uh, much pain, much suffering, so like with the children there in Bethlehem and the surrounding areas. Like Rachel, and then Rachel was the mother of Benjamin, and she actually passed away earlier than Jeremiah, but she also is weeping for the children at that time. And so he's giving us a picture here of what was taking place in in the, the terror of it all, the sadness of it all that Herod could go in and just do that without any problems. I find it interesting that that our government right now is is purchasing guillotines. I don't know if you knew this or not, but they have purchased a lot of guillotines and, and they're storing them. Why are they doing this? That's the question that we should be asking ourselves. Why are they buying guillotines? Guillotine is, a, is an old form of execution. We have better technology to take care of of people you know we can do a lethal injection we can do gas i mean there's all kinds of other ways that you can kill why guillotines strange isn't it if you listen to and i don't always agree with him wally shabbat he talks about um the mark of the beast 666 right which is the number of a man he actually tells us that it's not greek it's aramaic and the number 666, if you look at it in the Aramaic, it's talking about Muslims. And it's talking about what they wear. The jahid attire. The, the markings on their arms. It's the same symbols. The 666 is actually a symbol. And when you break it down, it's the symbol of a Muslim jahidist. And so he's suggesting that, that uh, 
Possibly the mark of the beast will be the fact that you have to convert to Muslims. And what happens if you don't become a Muslim, you reject it as a, as a heathen or as a Jew? What do they do to you? They behead you. Why are we purchasing guillotines? Could it be for the Antichrist when that day does come and we're all sent to camps? There's camps out there too, by the way. They're already set up to keep, 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 keep people in, not to keep them out. They're set up that way. Why is all that? Interesting stuff going around. You know, we, we need to think about these things. Great mourning and weeping taking place. We're living in great times. So God's judgment comes upon Herod, verse 19. But when Herod was dead, or when he died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. You remember, uh, last week we looked at how the angel told them that we'll, as soon as uh, we come to you, we'll tell you what to do. The angels told Joseph. And so immediately when Herod died, or as one translation, his decease occurred, then exactly as the Lord said, he came to uh, Joseph in the dream uh, to leave Egypt. Now the death of Herod occurred in the spring of 4 BC. Josephus tells us that Herod was about 69 years old when he died. Uh, a feverish illness came upon him and he passed away in the 37th year of his reign. Oh, and so illness came upon him, probably brought by the Lord as, as judgment. I don't know, but that's what happened. This is the fourth time that the Lord has spoken to Joseph in a dream. Uh, Joseph, we don't know a lot about Joseph and his, his ministry is short-lived and so it seems like his ministry was a ministry of sleeping a lot <laughs> and he was ministered to while he was sleeping. That seemed to be the time that God spoke to him and then he acted upon those dreams as he uh, uh, responded to God himself. What did the angel say? Verse 20, uh, saying... That is the angel, arise, uh, take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Egypt. For those, now in the Greek it actually says he, for he, that is Herod, who sought the young child's life are dead. And so the false worshiper dies. The wife of Herod actually um, was so terrified of the Jews after Herod had died that she went through and just released all the Jewish prisoners right away to hopefully find mercy for herself and then mercy for them too, Josephus tells us also. Then we see in verse 21 through 23, um, Jesus returned to, to Nazareth. Ma uh, Matthew here makes no mention of Nazareth, by the way having been the hometown of, of Joseph and Mary. We learn that from Luke. <clears throat> he just says that they went there uh, by the orders of the angel. Luke 2.39 says, When they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And so it was their city, it was their home. Matthew just points out that it was a fulfillment of, of prophecy. So we learn that through Luke. Verse 21. Then he arose, that is, Joseph and Mary and the young child took or brought the young child and his mother with him and came into the land of Israel or to go into and enter into that land. But when he, Joseph, heard that uh, Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid. <clears throat> or to be afraid. He saw that Herod's son was there and immediately he was afraid in his heart that something would happen. And so he was concerned. And then being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside. There's another dream. Or he, he withdrew uh, to take refuge somewhere else. And so into the region of Galilee, which was a part of a district there in that area. So after the death of Herod, his kingdom was divided into three sections, to three of his sons. Herod dies and he gives off his kingdom to three different sons. Archelaus obtained Judea and Samaria there, where Joseph was going to enter into Nazareth. Nazareth was, it's a small little quaint town. When I was in Israel, we visited Nazareth and it's very small, very hilly. And there was one site that we went to, 
to give us an idea of, of, of how Jesus probably lived with Joseph and Mary. And so we went into this site, and as uh, you enter in through the building, you come to the back uh, of the place, which was all hilly and dirty, dirts. And you had a couple of little vineyards. You had cows out there with yokes on them. You had a little building where, the, where they lived. And so they kind of tried to give you an idea of what it was like during the time of Christ. And you go into the, the the little home and it's dirt floors and you have a little stove and oven there where they probably cooked and uh, they had little benches made out of, of dirt, you know, and, and maybe even a bed. The roof was flat and it had straw over it so you can kind of see that they could walk up on top and just see things. They had uh, the vineyards out there and then they had uh, a rock literally a rock it wasn't like a cement slab it was a rock and they would you would see how they would crush the grapes and they they somehow carved out uh, an area where the 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 juice would flow into an area and, and so forth and they take the animals and they yoke it up with someone else and show you how that all worked and so they gave you a good idea what it was probably like during the time of Christ and it, it's not like how we live today far from that you know, very rural, very dirty, very open, very hot. You can't just go take a shower every day. So you're sweating every day, if not once a month, probably taking a shower. So, I mean, it's you're out there in the wilderness or in the desert, and you're just trying to get by as, as best as you can. And so um, Archelaus was ruling over that area, and that's why they didn't go. Herod Antiochus, he ruled over Galilee and Perea later on down the road. And then Philip um, also was another son that uh, ruled um, over uh, a certain area. And he became uh, Tetrarch. You probably heard that also. Archelaus was actually going to become a king like his father. They were going to make him king. But because of some of the things that he was doing and cruelty, he was just as cruel as his father. I guess the Romans decided that they would not uh, allow him to be king uh, over uh, the people there. And so they banished him uh, from the area. And so Joseph and Mary come back to the same place where they had started in the beginning there in Galilee. <clears throat> and this was where <coughs> Mary had first received the dream from, from Gabriel, the angel that she was going to have the child Jesus. And verse 23 says, He came and dwelt, or to live, in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarite. And this word Nazarite um, is referring to the area, the location. He's called a Nazarite because that's where he dwelt and he lived. But there's also a Nazarite vow that you can take, and you find that in the Old Testament. Um, there's also a fulfillment of scripture here from Numbers uh, 6.13, Judges 13.5, Isaiah 11.1, 1, Jeremiah 23.5, Zacharias 3.8, for those that will be listening on the tape that might want to look those scriptures up, that spoke of the Messiah as a branch that came out of Nazareth in that area. So fulfillment of, of scripture. Let me close. <clears throat> uh, Herod brought this all down upon himself. When you really think about it, this was all his own fault. He could have embraced Jesus, but instead he decided to be in a race with Jesus. You can't live your life that way. We have to embrace Jesus and his commandments, his precepts and his word. We can't be in a race with him. We can't be testing him. We can't be challenging him. We have to submit ourselves to Him. And any time that we decide to live our lives the way that we desire to live them, that's when we're racing with Him. That's what happened with the children of Israel with Jeremiah. They wanted to do what was right in their own eyes. And they were living their own way. And it was a race with God. And guess who wins? God. That's something we need to learn. Jacob coming back to his hometown, making up with his brother Esau. And one night he's praying to God and God reveals himself to him. And what does he do? He wrestles with God. He's fighting with God. I mean, that to me is ridiculous for someone to think I can fight against God and even win. It's like me saying, okay, Arnold Schwarzenegger, come on, I'll arm wrestle you. Yeah, really? Okay. <laughs> I beat you. 
make my day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on. That's that's like okay, Arno. I'm gonna be <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, just boom. Okay, let me try one more time. I know I can get you. You know, that, it's ridiculous to think you can wrestle with God. And what did God do? He just he just touched the the, the hip of Jacob, and he was crippled. He was crippled. And so from that point on, he was known as Israel, ruled by God. Jacob means supplanter or, or one that wants to rule his own life, doing his own thing. But God says, no, you're going to be ruled by me. Why do we race against God? We're, we're not going to win. We should embrace his commandments because we know they're good for us. You know, being angry is not the solution. Being frustrated is not the solution. It doesn't change anything, does it? It doesn't change anything at all. It, it only th- makes things worse. So we need to embrace God. We need to pray. We need to let God have the reins and lead us and guide us. And by the way, even if you're right, he's still leading you and guiding you. He's still leading you and guiding you. Even though others are wrong around you, you just live for him and you glorify him in everything. And that's what he wants us to do. And even if they're wrong, even if they're wrong, that's okay. That's between them and God. Who are we to tell another man how to run their servants? I had four boys. I didn't, I, if someone were to come in and say, this is how you ought to raise your children, they're not doing blah, blah, blah. I'm like, hey, wait, what are you doing? These are my children. Don't come in here and tell me how to raise my children. You have your children, your own children. You take care of your children. Let me take care of my children. Now, I'm not saying they're suggesting that we shouldn't get advice and read books at all. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about someone that just comes in and says, you better be doing this and that. Like the school system telling us how to raise our children. They have no business telling us how to raise our children. And yet they keep thinking that they do. And they can tell us how, and yet they can't. We need to let God have the, the, the reins, and we need to trust in Him and, and, and know that we're not in a race with God. We're to embrace Him and His commandments. Like Herod, it was his own fault. It was his own demise that brought him to death, unfortunately. And it's sad that people have to get to that point. What we need to do is repent. And I think, I really do think and believe that if Herod would have stopped and says, wow, something great is happening here. And instead of being a part of casualties, and if he would have repented and turned and embraced Christ, God would have done a great work in Israel. But he wouldn't have it. <clears throat> See, because God wasn't forcing him to do evil. God wasn't making him. It was his choices. God was trying to embrace him like he tries to embrace all of us. So let's embrace Christ and not be in a race with him.